duck's demeanour has completely changed since they started molting. You can see how kind of pale and insipid their plumage is at the moment. And they're out and not chasing the hens, so it's nice for them to be able to just hang out outside. They're eating a lot of grass seed heads at the moment. Might be because they're a bit higher in protein and so they're using that to um, grow their new feathers. But as you can see there's lots and lots of preening going on. Hello you two, come say hello. That's Matilda. She's a not particularly good example of a well summer. <laughs> so that's Wendy. And she's cross because she can't get into this coop, which is where she's normally been laying her eggs. But she shut out of there, and I'll show you why. There we have a broody hen. She might go in here, because that's another place they like to lay. For the avoidance of all doubt, they do actually obviously have a perfectly good nest box in their own coop, but um, where's the fun in that, eh? Oh, here comes Hazel. She's also going to be a bit cross that she can't lay in that coop, so maybe she'll trailblaze a bit and go into this house. They're just eating all the seed heads of the grass at the moment. They're loving them. I can't really graze the rabbits around here so the grass always gets really long. Maybe. Here's Snowy having a preen. Chickens tend to molt in the autumn, so a little bit later on in the summer, um, and they will stop laying. And they tend to lose their feathers kind of in a bit of a lump. I've got some hens who just literally lose them all overnight. You go and look in the coop and it looks like somebody's split a cushion in there because there's just feathers absolutely everywhere and you get a bald hen and they have to wear a little jacket to keep them warm. Most hens just lose them gradually and um, they look a bit scrappy for a few weeks and have to be a bit careful with the rooster because obviously their skin's exposed. But um, all birds spend an awful lot of time preening. It's a kind of social activity as well. Once one starts, they all, they all get going. But yes, preening's very important to keep feathers um, so it keeps them insulated, keeps them waterproof, so yes, it um, makes sense to invest time in grooming. Doesn't it snowy? You can see Cassandra sunbathing here. Sunlight's a really good immune booster for chickens so it's important they get the chance to enjoy some rays. So she's nodding off there a bit, displaying her wing feathers out. 
She's a Wyandotte cross and she's got that beautiful pencilling on her feathers and um, the black of her tail and her neck are really beetly green sheen. Absolutely gorgeous plumage. Get out of the way, Ralph. He's Karen enjoying a good old dust bath. She's molting and um, bathing, dust bathing. Basically kicks up all the dry sand and dust into their feathers. So when they shake, they shake out any parasites or bits of dander that are stuck in their feathers. It's quite a social activity as well and they'll quite often sort of tuckle up and sit on top of each other and, and jostle for the best space in the dust bowl which actually surprisingly in this case is in the coop normally it's in a newly sown seed bed but um, it's nice and dry under here Ralph looking on protectively You can see how tatty John's feathers are. John's the one nearest. It's more difficult to tell them apart when they're molting because they haven't got quite such distinct plumage features. But I know that's John because he's got one wing shorter than the other. That's because he's been pinioned, which means just the very tip of his wing would have been nipped off when he was a duckling. Uh, and it just means that he can't fly. So ducks are slightly different from other birds in that they molt all their flight feathers at once. So most other birds will push out one feather sort of sequentially from their flight feathers. So although it might um, mean they're not quite as effective, they can still fly perfectly well. And this is why sometimes if you look up and you see a crow or a buzzard or even a pigeon, and they've got a sort of a notch out of their wing as they fly over. That's because they're molting and you'll, you'll see them, you know, they have different feathers missing at different times. So they kind of push one out, one after the other. And so they always have flight feathers, whereas ducks molt them all at once. And I'll see if I can get up a bit closer. So this, this feather here on the side of fudge, you can see it's just sort of being pushed out and they'll all, they'll all fall out and in a few days, they won't have any of these longer primary feathers, so they can't fly. So that means that they're very vulnerable to predators because they can't obviously fly out of the way. So what they do is they, they molt their body feathers as well, but they just, they molt them into a sort of dull, dowdy kind of plumage just while they get rid of their primary feathers. And then as their primary feathers um, grow back, their flight feathers, they will um, then also grow back their sort of bright, bright coloured um, plumage feathers as well. But it can be a bit disconcerting because, um, especially if you're, you know, watching ducks on a pond or something like that, because it seems like all the drakes have suddenly vanished. But actually, it's just they've gone into their eclipse plumage and um, are keeping safe from predators. But yeah, these they do look completely different. Uh, they haven't got any of the sort of iridescent green or the sort of lovely beetle black head that they normally have. So yes, they look very, very different to normal. Domestic ducks don't need a pond, but they do need fresh water. So I tend to prefer having smaller tubs of, of water that I can clean really easily. This is an enamel bowl I got from an antiques fair. Um, I normally use it for washing my potatoes. Anyway, so I prefer to give them smaller tubs that I can just change the water really regularly. Um, 
I use the sort of rubber feed buckets, horse feed buckets normally. But this time of year when they're molting, they need, they really need a lot of opportunities to preen properly. As you can see, fudges going great guns here. So um, that's what I tend to do. Just leave them lots of little tubs of water around the garden. And as you can see, they're, um, they're quite happy to just preen. They've stopped chasing the hens because they're, they're, it's about four or five weeks of the year when they're molting that they're not actually interested in having sex. So um, it's quite nice and relaxing to have them around because they don't try and run off, they're not chasing the hens, they're not just being um, uh, a, a bit sort of hard work. Um, so yes, I, um, I actually quite like them. It's a bit like when your children are ill and you kind of think, oh, actually it's quite nice to have a bit of a break. So, um, but no, they're very sweet. This feather you can just about see the iridescence, it turns kind of blue black, it looks brown straight on. But as I turn it, it gets that blue black sheen. Here's a handful of the duck's feathers, this lot have just fallen out today. And here are the duckles. You can see their long feathers have all fallen out and the secondary they're going to start coming out soon. Nothing bird-brained about this chook. She's worked out that there's an entire field of wheat just outside her coop. So she's helping herself. Got to keep an eye on her though because I saw a fox a couple of days ago with a wood pigeon it had caught. Because the pigeons sit on top of the corn and, and peck out their kernels and um, it smells a bit of foxes around here. So I'm going to have to um, put her back in in a minute. But yeah, she's um, enjoying this. is all the cuttings of the um, geraniums that I took a couple of weeks ago and remember that from the vlog. So basically what I've done is I've left the cuttings or the cut foliage on this um, shower curtain for the day. It's been really hot today and so under here all the seeds. Absolutely hundreds of them. And they're lovely and dry. Um, so what I'll do is I will carefully pop these on the compost. I have got some more to cut. So I'll pop these on the compost because most of them have popped out when the sun was on them you could hear these seed heads popping but I think all the ones that are going to come out will or rather have done so now so I will 
put them on the compost and gather up the seeds. Here we are. I'm just going to use my little sieve over a seed tray to just get the worst of this out, although most of the seeds have fallen to the bottom already, as well as quite a few little wood lice and jumpy things. Let's see how many seeds I've got here though. Here are my seeds. Quite a few of them. So I'm just leaving them tipped up, propped up against this seed tray so that the various creepy crawlies can creep and crawl their way out. And then I will put these in a jar. So I can um, parcel them up and either give them to people or sow them. And I look forward to seeing what combinations come up. I'll use the same um, cut and put onto a shower curtain technique with these for bascoms as well because they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tiny seeds and they're a really good bee plant and the moths like them as well. Hello lads. And this catmint catnip is another one I'll use same technique because again this has lots of little seeds and it's another excellent bee plant you can just see the little black seeds in the bottom there down inside there so not just for cats Napita really really good bee plant So here we are, I've got my seeds and most of the creepy crawlies have kind of seem to have left overnight so I'm going to pop them into this jar now. So just tip them in, so there they are. Now the next thing we need to do is label them. So I'm just going to pop this in here because I cannot tell you the number of random envelopes and jars full of seeds. We oh, remember those. Of course you never do. So pop the lid on and they then need to go somewhere um, sort of cool and dark, not or rather you know nowhere sort of hot and obviously you don't want them to get damp at all. So um, just put them somewhere you know in a, in a cupboard or larder or something and um, yeah they'll be good well, I mean, they'll last a couple of years, certainly, So, um, but I'll be sowing these probably in the autumn. Um, I will just broadcast some around the garden just so that they can self-seed. Um, but yeah, their geraniums do really well if you sow them in the autumn and then kind of overwinter them because they, they come back in the spring really, really well. So um, yes, let me know if you'd like some seeds. time oh, a couple of months ago maybe and um, I really like a cobbler it's kind of a bit a bit more than a crumble 
um, but a bit less than a kind of a pie or a sponge. So I really like it. And I get a mixed fruit and vegetable box from Egg and Cole and um, quite often the uh, peaches are, you know, they're delicious if they ripen perfectly, but my um, house is quite cold and they don't tend to ripen particularly well. So it's a good way of using peaches. So um, that's trying to get out. So first of all, I've got, I'm using a recipe from BBC Good Food and these are the flat, organic flat peaches. And I've got a La Creuse pan here, which I've buttered. And I'm just going to chop the peaches roughly. In the recipe it says to use tinned peaches, but I'm obviously using fresh here, but you could use tinned. It also works well with uh, plums, um, nectarines, so yeah, you can kind of cobble anything really. sprinkle a um, teaspoon of oh, the one, ground ginger on the top um, of the peaches and also two tablespoons of I'm using demerara sugar here. I'm just going to do one actually because these peaches are actually quite sweet. So that's the fruit, I'll just leave that there. I'm not going to weigh out the dry or the cobbler ingredients. So I need 150 grams of plain flour. And 150 grams of butter. Teaspoon of baking powder and half a teaspoon of cinnamon. I'm now going to put that in the mixer and um, get it to kind of breadcrumb stage with the um, butter and the dry ingredients. There we are, so that's all mixed. I'm just going to pop in an egg now. to make a sort of thick, thick dough. So what I'm going to do now is just place the cobbler dough in sort of blobs, would probably be the technical term, on top of the peaches here. So I don't want to kind of completely cover, uh, so it's not like a crumble. I want to leave some nice gaps between, because then the fruit sort of bubbles up between the, um, the sort of uh, sections of dough. So I'm just going to pop them on like this. Here we are, here's the uh, finished cobbler, ready get to go into the oven. So that goes in at about 180 for about 25 to 30 minutes. You see it's lovely and brown and crispy on top. And then we've got the soft peaches underneath. Absolutely delicious. So 
cream is lovely with this but I'm actually going to sew it with custard because I've got lots of milk and I don't need any excuses to make custard so that's what I'm going to be having with the peach cobbler for dessert. <music> concludes the vlog I hope you enjoyed it um, I'll be back next week with more tales from shore pits see you then